Today's episode is brought to you by Beam. Transform your sleep with Beam's dream. It's the secret behind 15 million nights of improved sleep. Imagine how many nights that is. Well, it's 15 million, isn't it? Fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and wake up refreshed. Get up to 40% off at shopbeam.com slash pdb and use the code pdb. It's Thursday, 9 May. Welcome to the President's Daily Brief. I'm Mike Baker, your eyes and ears on the world stage. Let's get briefed. Today, we start in Europe, where several countries are fighting back against Russia's shadow war, taking measures to shore up security following accusations of Russian spying, cyber attacks, and GPS jamming. I just can't imagine that the Russian service would get up to those sort of shenanigans, but there you go. Later in the show, we turn to Ukraine as Russia has launched one of its most devastating drone and missile attacks to date, targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Plus, we'll take a look at the surprising rise in political violence across Europe in the lead-up to critical EU elections in June. Finally, in today's back of the brief, with the IDF continuing its limited operations in Rafah, at least one member of Congress is now calling for the arrest of Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and other high-ranking Israeli officials, accusing them of violating the Genocide Convention under international law. But first, today's PDB Spotlight. Here on the PDB, we've been tracking Russia's shadow war, which targets not only Ukraine, but also those countries supporting Ukraine's fight against Putin. This covert conflict involves cyber attacks, targeted assassinations, and political strong-arming. Today's reports from across Europe detail three separate incidents, revealing the extensive reach of Russia's operations against its perceived adversaries. We'll start in the UK, where Britain has revealed a number of measures to curb spying activities among Russia's diplomatic delegation. Most notably, they announced that they'll be expelling Russia's defense attaché, who they've accused of being an undeclared military intelligence officer. In addition, the UK removed diplomatic status from some Moscow-owned properties that the British government believed to have been used for intelligence purposes. In an address to Parliament, Britain's Interior Minister James Cleverly said Britain was already an extremely challenging operating environment for Russian intelligence services, but the measures would, quote, only serve to strengthen our resilience to the Russian threat. The UK has also summoned Russia's ambassador to give him a bit of the what for and to inform him of the measures. Moving now to Warsaw, where Polish officials are accusing Russia of engaging in a campaign of cyber espionage. Specifically, a hacking group known as APT28, or you might have heard them called Fancy Bear, isn't that a clever name, which is connected to Russia's military intelligence agency, the GRU, has allegedly used malware to infiltrate computer networks of Polish government institutions. Additionally, this group is accused of conducting a broad cyber espionage campaign against German defense and aerospace firms and a major political party. The attacks on Poland are reported to have extended to critical infrastructure, including the water supply and health service. The accusations suggest that Russia is engaging in these activities to gather sensitive information and potentially disrupt governmental and critical operations in these countries. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Finally, we'll move to Estonia, where the country's foreign ministry has summoned the head of the Russian embassy to protest the jamming of GPS signals. Estonia has accused Russia of jamming the signals over the airspace of the Baltic states, which is considered, of course, a violation of international regulations. The jamming disrupts the GPS navigation systems used by aircraft and other vehicles, which rely on this technology for accurate positioning and timing. What Russia is doing is particularly dangerous because it affects the safety of commercial flights by interfering with their navigation capabilities. This kind of disruption is part of what the Estonian government has referred to as, quote, hybrid activities by Russia, which basically involve covert and overt actions designed to destabilize and undermine countries without engaging in open warfare. All right, coming up next, we head to war-torn Ukraine, where Russia's latest drone and missile strikes target the nation's energy infrastructure. Plus, 
we explore the surge in political violence across Europe ahead of crucial. Today's episode is brought to you by Beam. Transform your sleep with Beam's dream. It's the secret behind 15 million nights of improved sleep. Imagine how many nights that is. Well, it's 15 million, isn't it? Fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and wake up refreshed. Get up to 40% off at shopbeam.com slash pdb and use the code pdb. It's Thursday, 9 May. Welcome to the President's Daily Brief. I'm Mike Baker, your eyes and ears on the world stage. Let's get briefed. Today, we start in Europe, where several countries are fighting back against Russia's shadow war, taking measures to shore up security following accusations of Russian spying, cyber attacks, and GPS jamming. I just can't imagine that the Russian service would get up to those sort of shenanigans, but there you go. Later in the show, we turn to Ukraine as Russia has launched one of its most devastating drone and missile attacks to date, targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Plus, we'll take a look at the surprising rise in political violence across Europe in the lead-up to critical EU elections in June. Finally, in today's Back of the Brief, with the IDF continuing its limited operations in Rafah, at least one member of Congress is now calling for the arrest of Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and other high-ranking Israeli officials, accusing them of violating the Genocide Convention under international law. But first, today's PDB Spotlight. Here on the PDB, we've been tracking Russia's shadow war, which targets not only Ukraine, but also those countries supporting Ukraine's fight against Putin. This covert conflict involves cyber attacks, targeted assassinations, and political strong-arming. Today's reports from across Europe detail three separate incidents, revealing the extensive reach of Russia's operations against its perceived adversaries. We'll start in the UK, where Britain has revealed a number of measures to curb spying activities among Russia's diplomatic delegation. Most notably, they announced that they'll be expelling Russia's defense attaché, who they've accused of being an undeclared military intelligence officer. In addition, the UK removed diplomatic status from some Moscow-owned properties that the British government believed to have been used for intelligence purposes. In an address to Parliament, Britain's Interior Minister James Cleverly said Britain was already an extremely challenging operating environment for Russian intelligence services, but the measures would, quote, only serve to strengthen our resilience to the Russian threat. The UK has also summoned Russia's ambassador to give him a bit of the what for and to inform him of the measures. Moving now to Warsaw, where Polish officials are accusing Russia of engaging in a campaign of cyber espionage. Specifically, a hacking group known as APT28, or you might have heard them called Fancy Bear, isn't that a clever name, which is connected to Russia's military intelligence agency, the GRU, has allegedly used malware to infiltrate computer networks of Polish government institutions. Additionally, this group is accused of conducting a broad cyber espionage campaign against German defense and aerospace firms and a major political party. The attacks on Poland are reported to have extended to critical infrastructure, including the water supply and health service. The accusations suggest that Russia is engaging in these activities to gather sensitive information and potentially disrupt governmental and critical operations in these countries. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Finally, we'll move to Estonia, where the country's foreign ministry has summoned the head of the Russian embassy to protest the jamming of GPS signals. Estonia has accused Russia of jamming the signals over the airspace of the Baltic states, which is considered, of course, a violation of international regulations. The jamming disrupts the GPS navigation systems used by aircraft and other vehicles, which rely on this technology for accurate positioning and timing. What Russia is doing is particularly dangerous because it affects the safety of commercial flights by interfering with their navigation capabilities. This kind of disruption is part of what the Estonian government has referred to as, quote, hybrid activities by Russia, which basically involve covert and overt actions designed to destabilize and undermine countries without engaging in open warfare. All right, coming up next, we head to war-torn Ukraine, where Russia's latest drone and missile strikes 
target the nation's energy infrastructure. Plus, we explore the surge in political violence across Europe ahead of crucial EU elections in June. I'll be right back. Welcome back. Sticking with our coverage of Russia, the Putin regime unleashed a barrage of missiles at Ukraine on Tuesday evening in the largest attack by Russian forces in weeks. The massive bombardment lasted more than three hours and was again aimed at Russia's favorite target, and that of course would be Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Russian forces used a total of 76 weapons during the operation, including 55 missiles and 21 Iranian-made Shahed drones, according to a report by CNN. Reports indicate that 39 of the missiles and 20 of the drones were intercepted by Ukraine's air defenses. However, 16 missiles and at least one drone managed to make it through, including two ballistic missiles. Moscow targeted facilities in Kyiv and six other cities during the attack, hitting at least three thermal power plants run by Ukraine's largest power company, DTEK. They also struck two critical energy infrastructure facilities in the Lviv region, and Ukraine's state-owned grid operator said there was damage to generation facilities in several areas. Officials for DTEK, which accounts for roughly 20% of Ukrainian electricity, said 80% of their generating capacity has now been destroyed or significantly damaged. By Wednesday morning, Ukrainian officials were warning citizens to prepare for countrywide electricity rationing measures. At least nine Ukrainian regions experienced power outs on Wednesday, and officials have said more are expected. Three people were reportedly injured by the strikes, including an eight-year-old girl and a, a man who suffered severe shrapnel wounds. It's worth noting that the large-scale missile and drone attack took place on Europe's remembrance and victory over Nazism in World War II Day, which commemorates the surrender of the Nazis in 1945. Ukrainian President Zelensky called it another example of, quote, Russian terror and said, quote, the entire world must understand who is who. The world must not give a chance to new Nazism, end quote. Russia has long targeted Ukraine's energy infrastructure in an attempt to devastate public morale for the war and disrupt Ukraine's domestic production of weapons. The attacks have intensified over the past few months, crippling an already devastated energy grid. As we've previously discussed, Ukraine has been repeatedly asking for the delivery of more air defense systems as their resources run dry. A Russian missile attack in April destroyed the largest coal-powered thermal plant near Kyiv because they ran out of missiles for their air defense systems. While the U.S. and Europe have both recently approved comprehensive aid packages for Ukraine, which will include new Patriot air defense systems, delivery, of course, doesn't happen overnight. With that in mind, it appears Russia is kicking their operations into high gear before Kyiv can restock their defenses. And here's an interesting side note. While Russia is busy attacking and degrading Ukraine's energy infrastructure, the Biden White House has been pressuring Ukraine to not target Russian energy infrastructure that's within striking range of their available missile systems. The White House is reportedly concerned that attacking Russian refineries and other structures inside Russia could escalate the conflict. Now, it's a debatable strategy, given that Russia's primary source of revenue, their primary means of paying for their invasion of Ukraine, is oil and gas revenues. Minimizing those revenues, either through actual aggressive sanctions on Russian oil sales or targeting of their infrastructure, could, one might argue, be the most efficient way to deprive Putin of resources that he needs to continue his war. All right, I want to turn now to the mounting political violence gripping Europe ahead of EU and local elections later this year, as another prominent German politician was hospitalized after a vicious assault on Tuesday. For some context, political violence has been intensifying across Europe as various election races heat up, with attacks seen on politicians in Germany, Belgium, Spain, Sweden, and Ireland by far-right agitators. Germany, however, has seen a particularly unprecedented uptick in violence, with attacks on sitting politicians more than doubling since 2019. That's according to a report from the Associated Press. The latest attack came on Tuesday when Berlin's top economic official, an ex-federal minister who previously served as mayor, was assaulted at the Berlin Library by a man who beat her in the head with a bag containing a hard device. She was subsequently taken to the hospital to be treated for head and neck injuries. 
The violent outburst came less than a week after Matthias Eck, a German member of the European Parliament, was severely beaten by a group of four people while putting up campaign posters in Dresden. He was hospitalized on Friday after being repeatedly punched and kicked, and he required surgery to address his injuries. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and leaders at the EU have condemned the spiraling violence in Germany, while others said it was reminiscent of the political violence seen in the early days of Nazi Germany. Michael Kretschmer, the state premier of Germany's Saxony region, said, quote, This reminds me of one of the truly darkest times in German history, when people who are active in politics, who are dealing with political issues, are threatened by others, end quote. Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, was similarly fiery in her condemnation of the political violence. Now, she ran into a bit of controversy on Wednesday, however, after her center-right European People's Party, and that's the, the largest...